<clears throat> and continuing on in the uh, text from this morning, I hope it's been a help to you. I uh, enjoy this passage of Scripture. I like to uh, find places where, um, you know, the Holy Spirit gives us some things to unpack and to work on. And thus far, we've seen uh, two different aspects of this thought, um, approving ourselves. Uh, and so far, we've looked at approving ourselves in some things and approving ourselves by some things. And so far as we've thought about that, both of these are really um, actions and feelings and, and things that God works on us in our heart. Uh, and as we, we finished out this morning at 11 o'clock, uh, the last couple of verses there that we looked at, verses 8, 9, and 10, he says some things. He says, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. And uh, I got to thinking about that and that aspect of it. You know, we can approve ourselves all we want, but we cannot force someone to think of us in a specific way. Uh, that's what the world wants to do today. Um, I'm teaching my kids grammar, and one of my favorite things to come across are pronouns now <laughs> because they're such high-profile things in our world today. And I've mentioned it before when a person gets upset because they've been, uh, you know, well, I won't even say misgendered, but, you know, someone uses the wrong pronoun. A pronoun is a word that I use about somebody else to a third party. And so when you ask someone to use specific pronouns for you, it's basically you say, when, when you talk about me to them, I want you to talk about me like this. And uh, unfortunately, we don't, we don't get to pick that, good, bad, or indifferent, uh, just as a, a regular grammar uh, law or just as, you know, the freedom of speech. I, I can't force you to talk about me in a certain way. Now, I can bribe you and, you know, threaten you and everything else to try to get you to say specific things, but it wouldn't be genuine and from the heart. When I speak to Ethan, the pronouns that I would use are you and your, right? He's got no problem with those, unless for some reason his gender means that he is not himself, you know? And so I don't know what you do with that, but you and your, right? When I talk about me, my pronouns are me, my, I, right? I, that, that's, that's there. The only time I would use the other pronouns that everybody gets upset about is if I'm telling Miss Rosie about Ethan and I said he. Well, wait, all of a sudden he got mad. Listen, I'm not even talking to you. I'm talking to her. <laughs> and we make jokes about it and all that. Hey, listen, while I've brought it up, I'll just give you some commentary on it. It's a sad state of affairs. But hey, listen, there's some people out there that just want to cause problems and just want to have their way. But there are also some people out there that are genuinely confused because they've been let go. Uh, by the people that should teach them right. And so uh, I feel bad for anybody that genuinely doesn't feel the way that they, uh, you know, were born. I was reading through work, you know, stuff about my eye and scrolling down through and, you know, uh, uh, and it said uh, people assigned uh, male at birth are more susceptible. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you mean men? <laughs> and uh, I thought, boy, it's creeping in everywhere. It's all around us. Hey, listen, I would hate to have be growing up right now and being taught anything in that realm. You wouldn't know what to believe. And uh, we need some people that have some, some heart uh, to deal with folks like that. Uh, we're going to be uh, entering into a generation of folks uh, that if we witness to them and they get saved, we, we, we're going to have some big obstacles to overcome. We need to be praying about that now. Uh, you know, you, pray, you, you, you witness to somebody like that, they get saved, or you're going to have a hard time leading them into church and saying, hey, everybody, <laughs> this is my friend. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've got some things to, to overcome. But, hey, by the word of God, we ought to be the people to do that. And the reason I bring that up is because sometimes we as Christians, we live a certain way and then we expect the world to see us that way. We talked about things this morning that we approve ourselves in. We approve ourselves in all kinds of circumstances and situations. And we say, I've done it by the word of God in that circumstance. Like Paul said, no matter what, whatsoever state I am, right? I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to be what I should be. And then we go out into the world and we somehow expect them to realize that and understand that and say, oh, what a good Christian. But we're not always seen that way. <laughs> he says in verses uh, 8 through 10, he says, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report. And, you know, we have to approve ourselves as some things. 
as well tonight. He's going to give you a list here. We'll read them just to get the context here in verse 8. He says, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and not killed, as sorrowful yet always, I'm sorry, always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. Paul says we're going to be seen a certain way. And you as a Christian, he implores you, don't fall in with their understanding of who you are. Don't fall in with their commentary on what you are. I tell you, you listen to enough people who come down on our folk, our, our group, our, our, our flavor, whatever it may be, and you listen to them long enough and you'll start to get bitter. You'll start to say, you know what, we really are hypocrites. Well, of course we are. <laughs> Say, well, that Baptist church, that's where the hypocrites are. Yeah, you bet. We're working hard every single day to try to be less hypocritical. We're trying to work every day to be less judgmental. We're trying to work every single day to be less unkind, like we talked about this morning. But you'll find that in every church. Uh, you find me a church that doesn't have hypocrites in it, and uh, what they have is liars instead. And uh, you just you can't get away from it. Human beings are human beings. But tonight, as we think of approving ourselves, there are some things that we need to approve ourselves as. And I want to dive in and pick that apart a little bit tonight. So let's pray. Ask God to, uh, to give us some things and uh, help us tonight. Father, we are grateful to be here. And uh, Lord, although there have been obstacles and uh, Lord um, hurdles to get over today, uh, we're grateful that we've uh, come here to this final service and that uh, we still have uh, the promise of your presence. And Lord, we still have the hope of your uh, help for us tonight. Lord, the many prayer requests that have been mentioned, and especially those that have not, the things on our list. And uh, Lord, just names of people that uh, need you this week. I pray that we would see your hand at work and that we might have things that we might uh, just, uh, Lord, brag on you about. And uh, Lord, that we might just uh, be able to um, rejoice uh, together with answered prayer in the near days ahead. We pray you'd help us as we consider ourselves, as we approve ourselves tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Approving ourselves as some things. You know, again, back in our text in the uh, verses we looked at this morning, verses 3 and 4, again, the criteria is that we give no offense in anything, that the ministry be not blamed, that in all things we approve ourselves as the ministers of God. And so as we consider that, approving ourselves as some things tonight, number one, we are, appro- we are to approve ourselves as deceivers and yet true. As deceivers and yet true, the lost world is convinced that we are deceived. The lost world is convinced that we believe a fairy tale, that we believe, you know, uh, in, in uh, uh, you know, uh, hope, uh, that we believe in uh, things that we cannot quantify, things that we cannot uh, see and prove, and that's true. That very much is who we are. They tell us that our beliefs are fantasy that our Bible is nothing but children's stories, and that we are uh, codependent and weak to have to trust in Jesus Christ, and that it's all just a myth. And they try to point around the world and say, can't you see you've got this myth and that uh, that uh, society and this myth over here and, and that culture, and uh, can't you see it's all the same story? I say to them, yes, I 100% agree, it's all the same story, and it's because mankind desires the truth And in some parts of the world, they've strayed from the truth far enough that their stories have been twisted, but there's still the element of truth there. That doesn't talk me out of the Bible. If anything, that talks me more into it. That all through history, going back far before there was even uh, recorded history in some places, we see stories pop up that sound a whole lot like Joseph, or sound a whole lot like David, or sound a whole lot like Noah. Why? Well, because it's truth. They want God and His Word out of their science books, out of their classrooms, out of their politics, out of their lives. I'm teaching my kids biology. The title of our curriculum is Exploring Biology Through Creation. It's wonderful to go through. And uh, one day we just, we picked apart carbon dating. It was glorious, you know. A science book. It was was wonderful. Wonderful. But they want God out. They want to gloss it all over as false, as lies, as dreams, as deception. 
And they find ways to discount and disprove the Bible. Well, it says this over here, and here's the thing that we've done, and that disproves that, therefore this is wrong and this is right. I, uh, in our history class, took the kids through some things about uh, the missing links. You're familiar with the missing links? They tell us that we as humans, they tell us, that we as humans share a common ancestor uh, with the monkey, right? And so if you go back far enough, there's one creature that eventually became two different creatures, at least. And what they're trying to do is bridge the gap between that creature and us and say, well, if we evolved over millions of years, then there, there must be some creatures that were in between. And that's sound logic. If we evolved from that creature, there should be some creatures in between. And so I was reading the kids story after story of all of these missing links that they found. And they had one, and it was a man uh, that, you know, that was a humanoid creature thing, and I forget what they called it. And uh, they go through, and it turns out it was just a man with really bad rickets. <laughs> and I thought, well, there you go, disprove that one. Here comes another one. One of my absolute favorites, there was one that was found uh, on the land of a man who he owned a vast amount of property. His last name was Neander. And uh, they decided they had just one or two pieces of bone. And uh, they put together this whole thing, and he became known as what we know today as the Neanderthal man. And uh, you say, why is that your favorite? Well, because that man, Neander, uh, if you go looking through your hymn book, you'll find him. He wrote a song. It's called All Creatures of Our God and King. <laughs> Just pointing back to it, right? Pointing back to the truth. Hey, listen, they want to gloss things over. They, they'll do anything they can to disprove the Bible. And again, as I said this morning, nobody's using these other gods' names as, as curse words. Uh, but uh, also, nobody's trying to cover up the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Nobody's trying to disprove the Quran today. Nobody's going through Vatican II, well, except for the Baptists, and saying, hey, this is wrong, and that's wrong, and that's wrong. They, don't, they couldn't care any less. But for some reason, this book is being attacked. This book is being tried to be, be disproved. I've explored the Internet a little bit, probably too far than I, than I should. There are whole groups of people out there that like to snark on people like you and I, specifically people just like you and I, fundamentalists. And as I read through and listen to comments and hear what they say, what I find, at least what, I'm, what I'm, I'm sensing, is that it's a bunch of people who grew up in good, fundamental Baptist, many of them, churches, and were taught the truth, and they're trying to talk themselves out of it. And so they come down on everything we do, never on doctrine, on the way we look, the way we talk, the way we act, as deceivers, he says. They find ways to discount and disprove the Bible, at least in their conscience. They tear it apart. They analyze it, looking for the smallest error to exploit so that they can throw the whole thing away. I have a series of messages that I've been sitting on for a while called Mistakes in the Bible. You know there are mistakes in this book. There are. First one happened in Genesis chapter 3 when Eve gave in to the serpent. And there's a whole bunch of mistakes in here. I'll show them to you. I'll teach you through them. <laughs> But there's no contradictions. There, anybody wants to give you, hey, there's mistakes in the Bible. There sure is. First one, send us all into a life of sin and departure from God. They give you a great witnessing opportunity there. But hey, listen, they, they want to try to pick it apart and say, well, you know, over here it says this, over here it says that. What do you think about that? And I say, not much. That's what it says. Somebody brought to me one time in this same passage. They've got this guy's name, and it's spelled two different ways. I said, no way. How about that? What do you think about that? Well, if you think a spelling error is going to cause me not to believe this book, you got another thing coming. This one, they still put K at the end of magic. We fixed that a long time ago, but we decided not to update it because we're trying to stick with the old paths, right? <laughs> I can figure it out. You say, well, I read through there, and it's this name here and this name there. And if, if that gets you hung up on not knowing what the passage is about, you're going to have a whole lot more problems when you get through to some of the harder things to hear in this book. There's some prophecy in here that's going to need you to look a little bit closer than how things are spelled. <laughs> Hey, listen, I, I can trust this book. I, I, don't need any of the, I don't need any of the modern stuff. I don't need anybody to pick it apart and try to disprove it to me. They do it so that they can throw the whole thing away. But it's true. It doesn't just contain truth. It is the truth. It doesn't just speak truth. It is truth. We're warned, we're, we are warned that this would be the case. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah is kind of lamenting, and he, he's ready to give some... Um, some uh, prophecies about the Messiah. And he begins with the question, who hath believed our report? 
<laughs> he says, I've told you things that are great and glorious, and yet no, nobody seems to be taking it to heart. Romans chapter 3, verse 4 tells us, let God be true and every man a liar. Every man a liar. Let God be true. Romans 1.18 and verse 25 says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, who change the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the Creator. And listen, today we have to approve ourselves. We have to approve ourselves as deceivers and yet true. We have to go into this world and remind ourselves they're going to see you as a deceiver. They're going to see you as a liar. They're going to see you as somebody who's caught up in all the wrong things. Hey, don't let it get to you. Approve yourself. You say, but it's as deceivers. Yes, but it's as deceivers and yet true. <laughs> and yet true. We were promised that we would know the truth and that the truth would make us free. And God wants, to, uh, God wants us to approve ourselves. We know we have the truth. If we listen to the enemy, we're going to get discouraged, and we may even quit. it will be enough to drive you out, but we need to approve ourselves as true. As true. Boy, that's the truth. I've used so many things to try to prove this book. I've tried to explain it to people up, down, left, right, every single way I could think of. I try to use the world around me, the nature that I see. I tell people, I, I like absolute truth. I believe in absolute truth because it's stated, and whether or not I agree with it doesn't matter. Hey, Christian, approve yourself as true. Remember, when you leave this place, you have truth. Not a version of it, not, an, not a, a, a thought about it. You have truth. Use it. Remind yourself of it. He says, secondly, we need to approve ourselves as unknown and yet well-known, as unknown, and yet well-known. It is our human nature to desire notoriety. Uh, I've learned today there's a test. It's called the introvert test. Uh, everybody know whether you're an introvert or an extrovert? All right, everyone that didn't raise your hand, you're an introvert, okay? That's how it the, the test is this. Would you rather sit in a room full of people telling you how great you are, or would you rather sit in a room all by yourself? They say this is the test. And I heard somebody say, well, my ideal situation would for there to be a room full of people talking about how great I am, and I'm not there. <laughs> and somebody said, that's a funeral. <laughs> so I guess that's what he wanted. But if you'd rather be in the room by yourself, you're supposedly an introvert. And if you'd rather be in a room full of people telling you how great you are, then you're an extrovert. I guess that's the test. Uh, neither one of those seems ideal to me if we could have some kind of a, a middle ground, you know. Uh, you put me in a room full of people that tell me how terrible I am, you give me one person that's going to back me up, I can I'll take all of them, uh, every single one. But it's our desire, uh, I'm sorry, it's our human nature to desire notoriety. We all want to be known for something. I heard today, a terrible statistic, it takes like three generations to be completely forgotten. I thought, boy, that's harsh. That's rough. Three generations. I grabbed my child and said, remember me. <laughs> Why? Well, because our life is just this tiny little blip. And each of us, we, we want to leave a dent in history. We want to be known for something, you know? Very few people, very few people. It's an extreme minority of people that are remembered throughout history, at least here and now, and there's something about having your name known. Again, there have been a handful of Christians that have been well known. Those who have advised leaders or preached on the national stage or done some immense thing in society. But by and large, Christians have lived out their days and passed on into eternity without the world knowing who they are. And when we consider the people that are famous for these days, it really doesn't make sense. <laughs> Someone can fall down in a funny way and overnight become the most famous person online. That's what they're famous for. There's a whole family of people. I, I, I ought not utter their name in church. They are famous for being famous. That's all I can figure. Get their name. Hey, you're good to go. You're famous. Why? I was talking to my daughter about this. You know, we're talking about meeting famous people. 
I said, would that really change your life that much? I don't know. It would be neat to see this person, that person. And then what? <laughs> you tell the story. Hey, I met the president. And then what? Then what? You know, it's nice to meet somebody before they become became famous. You know, I shook that man's hand. By the way, handshake better than an autograph. That's one of my statements to live by. All the while, millions of Christians holding the word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, and fulfilling the Great Commission go by unnoticed by the world. But we are known of him. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3, the Bible says, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. I wonder if when we go to God and we start to tell him about the things in the world, and God, I, I know that this area over here, you know, there's, there's war going on. In this area of the world over here, you know, there's political issues in our country and there's immorality and there's all this and that. I, I just wonder, again, bear with me in my folly, I just wonder if the Lord goes, what are you talking about? And I, I don't mean to cheapen the Lord, but he might respond if he was me. We might respond with, I don't watch that show. <laughs> I'm watching you. I, I see what goes on in your life, and in your church, and in your efforts. You think about all the things that there are in the entire world, in all of time, for God to enjoy and for God to view and for him to get joy out of. He's interested in us. <laughs> our life, our thoughts. Our needs, our desires. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 tells us right now we see through our glass darkly, but then face to face, he says, now I know in part, but then I shall know even also as I am known. There's a veil between us and God from our perspective, but not on his. He sees, he knows, he watches, he cares, he loves. And we have to approve ourselves as unknown and yet known. Listen, if I go through this whole world and not a person knows who I am, in my opinion, too many people know who I am. I like to keep a low profile. Think about changing my name. See what happens. <laughs> As unknown, I get to heaven and my God looks at me and he says, Hey, Nate, who am I that he would know my name? He would know my heart. He would know... The stuff I don't tell anybody, not even my spouse, he knows it. And he knows it intimately. I may be unknown in this world, but hey, I'm approving myself as well known. Not just known of God. God knows everything. God knows everybody. But to be well known of him, be close to his heart, what a privilege it is to be a child of God today. The Lord God himself knows us. He knows the number of hairs on your head. Watching this come back in. It looks a whole lot lighter in here. I'm kind of afraid to see what pokes out. <laughs> he knows your frame. He knows that you're but dust. Still, he loves you. He knows our hopes and our dreams, our, fe our fears and our desires. And this world may never know your name, but he does. <laughs> and you ought to approve yourself as unknown and yet well-known. Thirdly, tonight, we need to approve ourselves. He says uh, here in verse number 9 in the middle there, as dying, and behold, we live. You know, in the Christian life, we must deny ourselves. We must. If we're going to live a Christian life that has any impact for Christ, any impact for eternity, we must die to self, and we must die daily. The lost don't understand that. I have tried to express that as a character of men, to men. And if a man is lost, he doesn't understand that. You as a man, you come last. You as a leader, you come last. You as a, as a person that should be being an example and, a, and, a, and a, a caretaker and a provider, you come last. And the lost man doesn't understand that. Liberal Christians don't understand that. Because each and every one of us, we know the acronym, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. You know, I think the problem with that is that joy is too small of a word. <laughs> because we say, sure, yeah, I come last, but it's just Jesus and others first. No, no, <laughs> it's Jesus first. And until we get a handle on that, don't go any further, okay? 
Don't worry about serving others if you don't put Jesus Christ first. Don't worry about serving others if he's not on the, on the throne of your heart. Don't worry about serving others if you don't have an intimate and, and, and uh, well-kept relationship with him. Put him first. We get that in line. And then literally every single other person on planet Earth. And then you. That's a whole lot longer of a word. <laughs> but I tell you, if we were to actually be able to accomplish that, what joy it would bring to our hearts. It's strange to think that the most vibrant spiritual life comes through dying to self. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Not just afflicted. Not just chastised. Not just, well, I keep my body under subjection. No, I am crucified with Christ. Paul was in with both feet, literally, nailed to a cross. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Does that describe your Christian life? Does that describe who you are as a Christian? To approve ourselves as dying, and behold, we live. That needs to be our, our, our identification. Who are you? I'm a dead man. This is not here. This is not anybody. It's Jesus Christ, Him first and foremost, to identify, to approve ourselves as dying, and behold, we live. To live is Christ, and to die is gain. Number four, he says there in verse number nine, as chastised and not killed. As chastised and not killed. Listen, Christian, we are not under bondage. The world wants to tell you we are. The world wants to tell you, well, you have this role and that role, and you've got this thing and that thing. I love being asked questions. Does your church make you blah, blah, blah? My church doesn't make me do anything, but my Savior sure does. <laughs> you say he forces you, twists your arm. Oh, no, let me, <laughs> let me explain. He has done everything for me. Therefore, anything he tells me to do, I, I'm going to try to do that with the best of my ability. Well, that's not bondage. That's servitude out of love. I can walk away anytime I want. Hey, he doesn't keep me. I'm not his pet. I'm not, I'm not his slave. If I want to go to the far country, I can. I just don't want to. <laughs> I know what it would do to me. I know what it, do, it would do to him. We are not driven like slaves. God is not killing us. That just pains me. When I hear Christians talk about the things they do for Christ like their obligations. Well, we got to go to church. Oh, do you? <laughs> what a terrible, terrible thing you must endure. It's quite the opposite. Sin is a bondage. Sin is slavery. The lost are slaves to sin. We've been set free from that. We serve him because of this fact. We serve Him because we're no longer slaves. We serve Him because we are free men today. Therefore, it would make sense that the Lord expects some things from us. That's what true freedom is. It's the freedom to do right. It's the freedom to be right. It's the freedom to follow Him and His, His law and His, His pre uh, precepts to obtain His blessings and His hand of guidance and protection in our life. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19 says, As many as I love, the Lord says, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Keep your account short. Make sure you got it cleaned up quick. Hey, listen, you say, well, God's going to come after you. Great. <laughs> come after me fast. Uh, parenting is much that way. Many a conversation interrupted as, hold on one second, I've got to go parent. I'll be right back. And I wonder what God is interrupted in as he comes and just knocks on my heart's door and says, hey, yeah, watch that right there. Why? Because he wants fellowship with me. Chastening. I'm not being killed. <laughs> I'm not being put away. The world will make you think that. But hey, identify. Um, approve yourself as chastened and not killed. It gets a little harder from here. And I'm going to do these a little bit out of order. He says in verse number 10 there in the middle, As poor and yet making many rich. As poor and yet making many rich. I think of Peter and John at the temple. Silver and gold have I none. 
And you know, people want things from you. We talked about this when we talked about our neighbors in the book of Proverbs. People want things from you. They want a handout. They want help. They want advice, whatever it may be. And it just seems to be that Christians, the ones that actually live for God, the ones that really are following Him and you know adhering to His principles, and the ones that probably have a relationship with Him, they, they don't have much in this world, monetarily, physically. Now, of course, we've all been blessed, you know. Excuse me, but I would be skeptical of a Christian billionaire. That's just my nature. Why? Because my, my Lord didn't even have a place to lay His head. He didn't have clothes for his back. Didn't have much in this world, and yet somehow we've amassed much spiritually today. Second Corinthians 8, verse 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. And yes, we identify as poor. I'm just a poor Christian. I'm just a poor preacher. I'm just a poor follower of Jesus Christ, but hey, we are making many rich. We don't make them rich, yet the ministry that we engage in does. Hearken, he says in James 2, 5, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? Again, it's a cross now, and it's a crown later, identifying and approving ourselves as poor and yet making many rich. He says in this same context, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. So what do you have to show for your Christian life? Bring it next Sunday. What do you have to show for your Christian life? What is it that you've amassed? What is it that you've attained? What is it that God has given you? And you say, well, I, I can't put it in a box. I can't make a pile of it. But hey, I have everything. Heard a great quote this week. He said the devil came by and he tried to take everything from Job, but what he didn't realize was that God was Job's everything and he was never getting that. Oh boy, that's good. I lose every monetary thing in this life. I still have everything because I still have him. I don't have much, but what I do have is eternal. I don't have much, but what I do have is going to make a difference, not just in this life, but for eternity. And then lastly, he says here in verse number 10, right at the beginning, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. You know, sorrow comes to us all. It finds its way. Sorrow is something we will not escape. Sadness. Heartache. Heartbreak. Sorrow. It comes to all of us. And sometimes we identify that way. <laughs> you know, you feel like Jeremiah, woe is me. You ever read through Lamentations? Boy, it's rough. You ever read through some of Job's writings? Half the Psalms are laments. You get in there and say, wow, you've really had it rough. This world wants us to identify that way as sorrowful. There are even false religions that would try to tell you that the sorrow that comes through Christ is really how you'll attain Him. He says, and yet, always rejoicing. I don't have to tell you again, I'm a King James scholar. Always means all the time and in every way, rejoicing. John chapter 16, verse 20, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that ye shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Hey, listen, there's not a thing that you will encounter in this world that God will not make up for at some point. He'll wipe away all tears from our eyes. And the Bible says that when that the redeemed of the Lord will return, he says that sorrow and mourning will flee away. No sadness in heaven. No sorrow in heaven. And as we think of these things, we think of all that Christ has given to us, and not just what we do, but in who we are. Our identity in Him should encourage us. Our identity in Him should be what makes us remember why we're here and what we're here to do. 
And so in approving ourselves, there's some things we ought to approve ourselves as. I'll recap it as you turn with me to 1 Corinthians 4. We should approve ourselves as deceivers and yet true. We should approve ourselves as unknown and yet well-known. We should approve ourselves as dying and behold, we live. We should approve ourselves as chastened and not killed. We should approve ourselves as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing all things. And we ought to approve ourselves as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. This world is not going to see it, but don't fall prey to that same mentality. Christian, know who you are. Approve yourself. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll finish as we begin in verse number 9. For I think that God hath set forth us, the apostles, last, as it were appointed to death, for we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place, and labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of the world and of the offscouring of all things unto this day. I write not these things to shame you, but as beloved sons I warn you. For though ye have ten thousand instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. You say, how on earth did Paul do that? Well, he approved himself as some things. And I preach the messages backwards today. Because if we have a problem approving ourselves in some things, it's probably because we have problems approving ourselves by some things. And it's probably because we've yet to identify ourselves and approve ourselves as some things. If we remember who we are in Christ, not what the world says, not what our, our fleshly mind thinks, but who we are in Him, it will give us the means to attain a relationship with Jesus Christ that by Him we can approve ourselves by some things, and then we will find ourselves approving ourselves in some things. Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you live there? Do you spend time there? Does Jesus Christ have the reign of your heart. When you find yourself approving yourself as a child of God, as one of His, as blood bought and redeemed and one that God is working on, it will help us to find some things in our life that Jesus Christ can work through us that in any circumstance we can approve ourselves and say, I, I know who I am, I know how I got here, and I know exactly what I need to do to flourish and to prosper in this situation, in this present evil, evil world, as we approve ourselves.